Hey guys, thanks for joining me for another episode of Play Games. My name is Lance, and today I'm going to teach you how to play Jaws. This is a new game by Ravensburger. It is a two to four player game, it takes roughly an hour to two hours to play, and it is a competitive game. So one player will be playing the shark, and the rest of the players are going to be the heroes hunting the shark. And this video is going to be a little bit different than normal, as the game itself is broken into two different parts, so I'm going to cover it in two parts. It'll all be contained within the video, but I'll be breaking each of the sections down, so I'll have the components and all that, just like I do with every video, at the beginning for the first part, and then the second part I'll pick up and have the components for that and all that and explain everything else. So if you're looking at just playing one of the sections, make sure you check in the description below, and I'll have timestamps to go to the different sections as well. So as always, if you find these videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button subscribing to my channel as it really does make a big difference, helps me to continue to grow and produce these videos. And if you want to stay up to date on all my videos, also consider ringing that bell so you get notifications anytime I release new content. So let's head to the table and I'll teach you guys how to play. The only set of cards you're going to use in Act 1 is the Amity Event deck. Each of these cards is going to have a title at the top, and then underneath the image is going to be the different beaches that these swimmers will be placed in. Each letter is going to signify one swimmer token that will be placed there. So for example, this one will have two swimmers in South Beach and one in East. Underneath that is going to be the effect that will take place for this turn. So with this one it says if the shark swimmer track is at 3 or lower, then you're also going to place additional swimmers in North, East, and West. And it will be one swimmer in each one of those sections. You're also going to have one card that will use the special Michael Brody token, otherwise you will not use this token when placing swimmers normally. And then some of these, as you can see here, this one has a whole slew of swimmers. We'll have one in north, two in south, two in east, and one in west, but then it provides the hooper player with an additional action this turn. So some of these will have good effects for the players, and other ones will benefit the shark specifically. The one thing I want to cover before moving into setup is the board itself. So first off, make sure you have the act one side face up, and this is going to be made up of 13 different locations. And the one thing I want to point out with this is movement. So with the boats and the shark player, on the ocean spaces, they cannot move diagonally. So we could not move from 2 to north. We must move from 2 to 1 or 6 first before moving into North Beach. And both the boats and the shark cannot move through land spaces. So if we were in space 8, we could not move to space 6, even though they're connected by land. We have to move around on the ocean spaces for the boats. Then the player that is playing Brody, again, he can only move on land spaces, and so again, he cannot move diagonally. He must move from one land space that is connected by another one. For setup, go ahead and place the main board out in the middle of the table and make sure that Act 1 is face up. Then go ahead and grab the Amity event, shuffle that up, and place that out. You can also place out all the different swimmer tokens. And the Michael Brody token, make sure that's off to the side. You can place that above the deck, as you won't use that unless that event comes up. Then place out all of the barrels in the shop. From there, select one player to play the shark, and give that player the shark dashboard, a tracker, their four power tokens, the shark meeple, and the shark tracker pad with a pen or pencil. The rest of the players will be playing the crew, and you're always going to use all three crew members no matter the number of players. So first we have Quint that'll go down in the docks, and he's also going to start off with two barrels. Then we have Chief Brody up in his house on area 6, and he will get the beach closed and binoculars. Finally we have Hooper who is going to start in zone 5, and he will have his fish finder token. For the shark player, go ahead and place your tag on the very bottom spot on the zero spot and the last part of setup is for the shark player so that player is going to open up their shark tracker and then choose a starting location which can be any one of the locations around the island it is recommended to start off in one of the beaches potentially so you have access to swimmers right away but you don't have to once you've chosen a location you'll mark it here so let's go ahead and say that we start in location five at that point, then we'll go ahead and close this, and then we're ready to move into the game. Act 1 is played over an undefined number of rounds, and each round is going to be broken into three phases. The event phase, shark phase, and crew phase. And this is going to continue until either the shark is able to eat nine swimmers, or the crew is able to attach two barrels to it. At which point, then the players will move on to Act 2. The first phase in each round is the event phase. So during the event phase, you're going to flip over the top event card and resolve its effects. So first off, we have Shark Alert, and with this one we're going to add two 
swimmers to South Beach, and we will add one to East Beach. Then we'll resolve any additional effects down below. So it says, if the shark swimmer track is three or lower, you're also going to place swimmers in North, East, and West. So as we can see here on the sharks tracker, it is below as he hasn't eaten anything yet. So he has below three, so we will add those swimmers as well. So we're gonna add one to North Beach, one to East, and one to West. The second phase in the round is the shark phase, and during this phase the shark player is going to get to perform up to three actions, moving around the board and eating swimmers. The shark player can also choose to use one of their power tokens during this round. For the examples that I'm going to show you in this, I am going to use the shark token just to explain things a little bit better, but normally you will not use this. You will keep all of your movements and actions hidden from the other players, and you're only going to reveal small pieces of details at the end of the round. So again, as you guys remember, we started off in location five, so we'll go ahead and place that here. And again, this is just for the example, you will not place that out. One other thing to note is the Shark Tracker does have a mini map in it, so you don't have to stare at the board and potentially give away your location to players that are paying attention. You can use the mini map to help plan out your turn. So then we're gonna go ahead and move into movements. So for each action we spend to move, we can move one space to an adjacent space. Spaces are adjacent as long as they're not diagonal, and you cannot cross land spaces. So with us being in location 5, we could choose to use one action to move into West Beach, we could use one action to move into North Beach, or out to sea into Zone 1. We cannot move into Zone 3, as that is a diagonal movement, and we cannot move from Zone 5 to Zone 7 as you're crossing a land space, even though they're adjacent to each other. The other action we can use during our turn is to eat a swimmer. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that we moved into West Beach, and then we use one action to eat the swimmer that is in that location. Each action we spend, we can eat one swimmer, and you will not remove those tokens initially. Those will happen at the end of the round when you give out that information. All of those actions are gonna be logged in your book and will be noted. So from there, we would have one action remaining, so we could choose to move into zone 7, we could move out to C into zone 3, or we could move back up to zone 5 and hope that Tooper doesn't notice that we're there. So again, let's go ahead and say that we finish off in zone 5, so we'll mark that in our location, and then we ate one swimmer in West Beach. Now we did not use any power tokens, but if we would have, then we would circle the initials of the power token we used. Then let's go ahead and take a look at the different power tokens that we have. So the first one we have is Feeding Frenzy. So this one is going to allow us to eat all of the swimmers in a location for one action. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that our shark was down here in South Beach. Normally it would cost us two actions to eat both of those swimmers, but we could play Feeding Frenzy to eat both of them as one action. The next one we have is Evasive Moves. This is going to allow us not to trigger any motion sensors this round. And I'll explain what motion sensors are a little bit later. The next one we have is Speed Burst. This is going to allow us, to, for one action, to move up to three spaces. So, for example, let's say that we had one action remaining from this location. We'll go ahead and use a Speed Burst, which will allow us to move up to three locations as one action. Now, you do have to spend an action to trigger this effect. And then the final one we have is Out of Sight. So there's a couple of special abilities. For Brody, he has binoculars, and Hooper has the Fish Finder. And normally when they use these, you'll have to tell them if you're in that location or nearby location, as I'll explain a little bit later during their turns. But if you play Out of Sight, then you can lie about this and tell them that you're not, even if you are. Now once you've used all of your actions, and if you choose to use a power token or not, remember again to log all of that information on your shark tracker, and then we'll move into the end of that phase. So during the end of the phase, you're going to tell the crew how many swimmers you ate, and at which beach you ate them. So again, with our turn, we ate one swimmer in West Beach, so we'll say that we ate one swimmer in West Beach, and then the players will remove that one token from West Beach. Now we will not have, we do not have to tell them when we ate that swimmer during our turn. The next thing we're going to have to tell them is if we triggered any motion sensors. Each barrel that Quinn launches throughout the game will have a motion sensor on it. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that we he had launched a couple barrels into West Beach and Zone 5. So at the end of the round, we're going to have to tell the players that we triggered motion sensors in West Beach and Zone 5. But we do not have to tell them when we triggered them and in what order we triggered them. 
if we start in a zone that has a motion sensor in it, it is also going to trigger it. So if we started in zone five and then moved away, we still triggered that motion sensor. So we are going to have to tell the players at the end of the round. And again, if we play the evasive moves power card or power token, then we do not have to tell them we triggered those even if we did. And then the last thing we're going to tell the players is if we use the power token. Again, you will not reveal this to the players. So let's go ahead and say, for example, that we used out of sight. You will simply discard that off the, the board back into the game box as each token can only be used once, but you will not tell the players which token you used. And all of the tokens are kept hidden from the players, so they will not be able to deduce which token that you used. And then we'll go ahead and move our tracker up one space for the swarm we ate. Now, if this is the ninth swim where we ate, then Act 1 is immediately over, and we'll move on to Act 2. The third and final phase in the round is the crew phase, and during this phase, each one of the crew members gets to activate their character in any order that they choose. But once a player activates their crew member, they have to resolve any actions that they want to take during the turn. And each crew member is going to have different actions that I'm going to take a look at in depth. During each crew member's turn, they're going to have four action points that they can spend to do a variety of different actions, and each character is going to have their own special actions they can perform. They can perform most of these actions multiple times during the turn, unless the action specifically says otherwise, and each player's board will have a list of each of the actions they can perform. So let's go ahead and start off by looking at Brody. So as you guys can see here, he has his list of actions. The first one is lets him move one space per action. And each of these spaces, again, must be adjacent to the space he's on. And he cannot move into the, any of the outer ocean spaces. So he must stay on the island and move from one land space to another. So for example, let's go ahead and say that he wants to move from space number six to North Beach, and that's one action. Or he can move to the central location or any other space that's adjacent to him, such as this one here, that one there, or that one down there. The second action he can perform is to rescue a swimmer. So if he's in one of the beach locations, he can spend one action to rescue one of the swimmers, removing the token and adding it back to the supply. If he's in the central location, he can spend one action to pick up a barrel, and you can only carry one barrel at a time, and then you'll simply add this to your player board. If he's carrying a barrel and he moves into one of the dock spaces, which is number five or eight, he can spend an action to drop that barrel into the dock, and each dock can have any number of barrels on it. The last two actions he has are going to have tokens, and he can use these once per round. So the first one are the binoculars. So if he is in one of the four beaches, east, south, west, or north, he may spend an action to do use his binoculars. In that case, if the shark is in that beach location, it must tell him, and then you'll place the shark token there. Now, if the, play, if the shark played out of sight power card, then he will not reveal himself and will say that he is not there. And the last action Brody can perform is the close the beach action. So if he is at the mayor's office or the Amity PD, he may nominate to close a beach as long as that beach has no swimmers in it. So currently right now he could close West Beach, in which case then he's going to place the beach closed sign. Now the next time that an event card would have swimmers be placed in West Beach, you will not place them and then you'll flip the token over to the opening soon sign. From there, then the next time that a swimmers are supposed to be spawned in West Beach, then this will be removed and no swimmers will be placed in there. Now, once a token is placed, he can choose to place it again in later turns and then simply move that token and again make sure that it's the beach close sign and not the opening soon. So, for example, let's go ahead and say that East Beach is closed and the next turn he is at one of those locations, he can choose to close it even if this one, say, had the token there. And you close this one, then you would simply move it and then place the beach close sign on it. The next crew we're going to look at is Hooper. So he has five different actions he can perform during his turn. So with that, the first one is to move up to two spaces. And again, these must be adjacent. He cannot move diagonal. So he could not move from five to three. He'd have to move to west and then three or up to one and then three. But he can move two spaces per action he spends. The next one, just like with Brody, is that he can rescue swimmers. So if he's in the same space as swimmers, he can spend one action to rescue each swimmer. If he is in the space with barrels that are either at a dock or out in the ocean, he can spend an action to pick up all the barrels in that space. Now, if he is in the dock and there's a barrel here as well, he must spend separate actions to pick up the barrel in this space or at the dock. And if a dock has any number of barrels, he will pick those up and add them to his card. 
If he's in the same space as Quint, he can spend an action to give any barrels he has to Quint. And the final action he has is to use his Fish Finder token. So when he is in a space, he can choose to use that Fish Finder token, placing it in that space that he's currently in. And then the Shark player will have to tell him if, he, if the Shark is in his location or a nearby location, which is any space, space that is adjacent to his that is not diagonal. So for example, if we played that in South Beach, the Shark would have to tell us if he's in South Beach or an adjacent location, which would be location 7, 4, 8 and he can use the fish finder token once per round. And the final crew member we need to look at is Quint. And Quint has four different options for actions he can perform. The first one is a move action, which allow him to move one space to an adjacent space. So again, no diagonal movement is allowed, so one space or one space. The next one is to rescue a swimmer. Again, if he is in the same space as a swimmer, he can spend an action to rescue him. Then they're gonna remove that token and add it back to the pile. If he's in a space with barrels, either at a dock out in sea, or with Hooper, he can spend an action to pick them up. And he has, each one is a separate action. So again, if we had a barrel in the dock and at a location at, in the ocean, he has to spend separate actions. So he could spend up an action to pick up any number of barrels at the dock or any number of barrels at sea. And the final action Quince can do is to launch a barrel as long as he has one on his ship. So Quint starts with two, so we can do this once per round. So he can launch a barrel into his space that he's in or an adjacent space. He cannot launch barrels over land, so he could not go from eight to six. And then once the barrel is placed, then if the shark is in that location, the barrel tags the shark and is going to be placed on the shark's dashboard, as you can see here. And then if this is the second barrel, the act one immediately ends and we'll move on to act two. Otherwise, the barrel will stay in that location for future rounds and become a motion sensor that can be triggered when the shark moves on there. Once all three crew members have had a chance to take a turn, then the round will come to an end and the players can start a new round starting with the event phase. This is going to continue until one of two different conditions is met to end Act 1 immediately, and it'll end it immediately when that, act, that different condition is met. So the first one is when the crew members attach a second barrel, and again, Quint is the only one that can launch barrels and attach them to the shark. The second one is if the swimmer track on the shark's board reaches the ninth slot, which again, the act will end immediately when one of these two conditions is met, and the players will move on to Act 2. Act 2 is going to use the set of six-sided dice included in the game, which is going to have one side with a blank, three sides with one hit, and two sides with two hits. Act 2 is going to use three different decks of cards. The first one we're going to look at are the resurface cards. Each of these cards will show a diagram of the boat with the eight different zones, and the red zone is going to highlight the resurface zone for the shark. Then we have the evasion rating, or the amount of damage the shark will reduce when taking damage, and I'll explain this more a little bit later. Some of the cards are also going to have the little hook symbol, which is the shake-off symbol. So if the shark has an attached item to it, it'll shake it off. And then finally, the number of dice the shark will roll when attacking for that turn. The second set of cards we have are the shark ability cards. And at the beginning of the act, the shark player will receive a number of these cards based on how well they did in Act 1. Each of these cards will have a title and then the effect of that card. And the shark player will be able to play one of these cards each round. And the final deck of cards are the crew cards. Each crew member will have their own set of two cards that they'll receive during Act 2, and then there's going to be a random deck of crew gear. And this deck is going to contain four different types of items. We'll have attachable items with the little hook in the corner, melee items, ranged items, and then one-use items, which will include chum, ammo, and shark cages. And this is going to be randomly dealt to the players based on how well they did in Act 1. And the final thing I want to go over before moving into setup are the ship's tiles. Each tile is considered a zone and is going to be broken into a water space and a ship space, which will have a separation of the white line. Each tile is also going to be double-sided with the undamaged side with two numbers in the water space. And the back side of the tile will have the damaged side with only one number in the water space. First off, with the undamaged side, the white number is the number of damage the shark player must do equal to or greater than in order to damage the ship and flip that token over. If the shark does damage equal to or greater than the black sided number, then he has destroyed this tile and will remove it from the game board completely. Act 2 is going to start with the shark player referencing their card to determine how many shark ability cards they get and how many crew cards are going to be dealt out. 
So first off, our Shark player is going to go ahead and shuffle up the Shark ability deck and then draw a number based on how well they did. So we got seven swimmers, so we're going to receive eight Shark ability cards. Any remaining Shark ability cards will be discarded back to the game box as you will not use them for this game. And the Shark player can go ahead and look at their Shark ability cards, but do not reveal them to any of the other players. Next, each one of the crew members will receive their crew gear cards that are specific to them. And then again, based on how well the players did, the crew members did, again, we'll reference our crew gear cards and receive a random number of these. Now with these, you can either deal them out randomly to the crew members, dealing them in any way you want to, or alternatively, you can deal out a number of these, look at them, and choose each crew member that wants to get which gear cards. So with us, we have five that we receive. So each player, let's give each player one, and then we'll give an extra one to... Brody, and Hooper. Any remaining gear cards will be discarded back to the game box as you will not use those for the rest of the game. Then the Shark player and all the other players will flip over their trackers and then place markers on the zero space on each tracker. Make sure that the game board is flipped over to the Act 2 side with the image of the boat. Go ahead and shuffle up the resurface cards and place them on the deck location. Go ahead and place out all the different tiles for the boat in order to create the boat. For the shark player, he's also going to receive the shark token and the three larger resurfacing tokens labeled A, B, and C on one side and having a shark fin on the other. Each crew member will receive their meeple and their coordinated target token that is of their color. You can also place out the three dice that you'll be using and the small resurfacing tokens labeled A, B, and C. Finally, each crew member is going to choose a location on the boat that they'd like to start, and there can be any number of crew members in any one of the locations. So let's put Hooper up on top, Brody will be in the back chumming, and we'll put Quint up here. From here, we're ready to start Act 2. Act 2 is played over an undefined number of rounds, and during each round, the players will go through six steps in order. This is going to continue until one of the endgame conditions is met, which is either the shark is going to win by eliminating all three crew members or completely destroying the orca, or the crew is going to win by eliminating the shark. The first step in the round is the resurface option step. During this step, you're going to reveal cards from the resurface deck, placing them on A, B, and C locations. Each of these cards again will highlight an area in red, and that is the option for the shark to resurface. Then you're going to place each one of the small red letters in the corresponding location. So with A, it'll go here in the water zone. B is over here. And C is the back. The second step in the round is the shark player is going to choose the location they want to resurface based on the three options that they have. They're going to use one of their large resurface tokens to choose that location. So let's go ahead and say that we choose location A. So we'll place the A token face down keeping the other two tokens face down as well so the other players do not know the location we've chosen. And then we can also choose to play one shark ability card from our the hand that we have. So let's go ahead and say that we play this one. So we'll place this face down underneath our token. The other two tokens can be removed off to the side so we don't get them confused. The third step in the round is the crew prepares. During this step, each player can move up to two spaces. They're going to choose one weapon card and place a target token. So the first thing I want to take a look at is movement itself. So each crew member can move up to two spaces. They are not allowed to move diagonally. And again, each zone of the ship is going to be comprised of two different spaces. We have a water space and a ship space that will be separated by a white line. Each space of the ship is considered adjacent if it shares an edge with another tile. And as the ship takes damage, this is going to change as well. Now each crew member that is in a water space is going to have to spend two actions to move back onto the ship, so it will require their entire movement for that round to move back onto the ship. But like I said, as the ship takes damage, this is also going to change the layout. So for example, if Quint was knocked into, knocked into the water and we have this damage space here, now he could move back onto this space of the ship, or he is now adjacent to this space and this space as the white line is not all the way up. So he could move on to this space or this space as both of his movement actions. With Hooper here, we can move him over here or we could move him over here if we wanted to as two actions or just one action. We can also choose to move into the water as one action and then we can move into an adjacent water space as another action. So let's go ahead and say that uh, Quint here wanted to move over here and Brody was gonna move over here. 
Once a player has completed their movement or chosen not to move, then they're going to select one weapon card which they wish to attack with. Each weapon card is going to have an icon in the upper left corner, and as you can see here, there are three different types. We have melee weapons with a hand icon, we have ranged weapons with a target icon, and attachable weapons that are going to have a hook icon. Any card that does not have an icon in the upper left corner is considered an accessory, and a player can play that as well as a weapon card. So let's look at an example of this. Let's go ahead and say that Brody here is going to play a pistol, and you'll place it above the player's board. Quint will use his machete, and Hooper is going to go ahead and use his hook. And then finally, each player is going to place their target token, and this is going to be based on the weapon that they've chosen to use. With ranged weapons, you can place your target token in any water space, no matter where you are on the ship. So with Brody, he'll place it here. With melee weapons or attachable weapons, they must target the adjacent water space to the space you're, or the zone you're in. So with Quint here, he must target zone B, and Hooper must target zone A. Now as the ship takes damage or zones are removed, this is going to open up some of those options as well. For example, let's go ahead and say that zone B here was damaged, and then let's go ahead and say that he is over here. So at this point, he could target zone B as it is considered adjacent now because the boat has been damaged and there's that open spot, or if zone, if zone B's token was completely removed, he could target it as an open space. So at that point, he could target zone B even though he's not in the same space. The fourth step of the round is the shark is going to reveal their location they're resurfacing. In order to do this, they're going to flip over their location token, and so we've selected location A. At this point, you'll go ahead and discard the other two cards to the discard pile and remove those markers on the board. The shark player will place his meeple on that location, and then if that location shows the hook symbol, then he is going to shake off any attached items that are currently attached to him. So you can simply discard those. Finally, if the shark player played a shark ability card, go ahead and reveal that as well. The fifth step in the turn is the crew is going to attack. So any crew member that selected the correct space that the shark is resurfacing on may perform an attack. Any crew member that selected the wrong space will remove their target token and will regain any item that they selected to use. From there, then the players, again, that chose that correct space can choose to use their weapon. They do not have to, so if the shark has a high evade rating, they can choose not to attack the shark. From there, then the crew members can choose to attack in any order that they want to. So let's go ahead and start with Hooper here. So he has the hook. It's going to use three dice. And it does have an ability that says that if you roll four or more hits, the shark is still wounded, but the hook is breaks. And then the hook will be discarded at the end of the round. So we're going to go and roll our three dice. And we rolled three hits. Then we're going to reference the resurface card and the shark's evade rating. If we've rolled equal to or less than his evade rating, then the attack is considered a miss and we don't do any damage. If we've rolled more hits than the evade rating, then we're going to do damage to the shark. We're going to subtract the evade rating from our number of hits. So with the evade rating of one, we'll remove one hit from the shark. And so we've done two damage to the shark. So he'll slide his marker down two spaces. From there, if the weapon has any other effects, those are going to be resolved. So with our melee weapon, we did not roll more than four hits, so this will be returned to our hands. Finally, with the other player, we have the pistol, and so he's going to roll two hits on that. And he rolls three damage. Again, we're going to subtract one from the evade rating, so we do two more points of damage. Finally, with ranged weapons, once they're used, then they're going to be discarded. So with the pistol, we have to discard it as it is a ranged weapon. Or if we have an ammo card, we can choose to discard an ammo card instead of discarding the weapon. The last step in the round is the shark is going to attack. And the shark can attack a ship space that it is adjacent to, or a crewmember that is in its space, or one of the adjacent water spaces. Initially, this is going to be very straightforward. But as the ship takes damage and gets destroyed, there's going to be a lot more options that are going to open up for the shark. So first off, I'm just going to go through the basics, and then I'll go into some advanced examples. So first off, again, like I said, the shark has that choice to attack one or the other. If they're available, as we don't have any crew members in the water right now, the shark can only attack the ship space that it is adjacent to, so this space here. So then it's going to go ahead and gather up the number of dice as shown on its resurface card, so we have three. And then it's going to roll those. And based on the number of hits that it gets, it'll do either damage or destroy that space. All right, so let's go ahead and roll and see what we get. 
So we do three points of damage, which would not be enough to destroy it, but it'll damage it. So in this situation, we would go ahead and flip the space over to its damaged side. Now, if any crew members are on that space and they are also knocked into the water, let's go ahead and say, for example, though, that we ended up rolling five hits. So in that situation, again, the crew members are going to be knocked into the water in that zone, and that space will be completely removed as we did more than the black number is, that is required. Now, in the second example, let's go ahead and bring it back, and let's go ahead and say that there was a crew member over here. So in that situation, the shark can choose again to attack the ship or a crew member. So let's go ahead and attack Brody as he's in the water for some reason. And so based on the number of hits that we roll, so we rolled four, he would take that number of damage. So he would drop his marker down to the fourth slot. So as you can see, it doesn't take a lot to bring our crew members down and potentially eliminate them pretty quickly. And then the final example I want to take a look at is going to be, let's say, for example, that in the previous turn, he destroyed this part of the boat. And so now we have crew members split here and he chooses to resurface in this space again. So now this whole zone is considered a water space. So when the shark comes up again, he can choose to attack this space, this space, or this space of the boat as they are all considered adjacent or water spaces. Again, this whole zone is a water zone and this one and this one are also water zones. So as you can see, as the ship takes damage, it really opens up a lot of options for the shark player. And a lot of players are getting this wrong as I've been seeing on the forums. So make sure that you're playing with all the adjacency rules correctly. As I said, with the shark coming up in a zone that is destroyed, it has a lot of different options to attack. It does not have to attack just this zone. So from here, let's go ahead and finish our example. So again, we'll go ahead and attack with the shark on that ship space, and we'll see what we do. So we did four damage. That'll be enough to remove that space. And then we also played the second helping. So this one is going to let him roll two dice on another part of the ship or that same part if we hadn't destroyed it. So let's go and attack this zone here as well. And we do four damage again, so that'll eliminate that zone on top of it. Then the final step in the shark's turn is that it is going to get bonus attacks before it submerges back into the depths. So each crew member that is in a water space that is with the shark or an adjacent space to the shark is going to take one die of damage. So again, we'll go after Brody first. He takes one point, so we'll drop his marker down one. And then we go after Hooper, who is going to take two points of damage. Once we're done with that, then the shark token is going to be removed. We'll clear the resurface token. We'll discard the resurface card. If we use the shark ability card, that'll be discarded as well and return to the box. And then the shark player will get his tokens back and the, the crew will get their targeting tokens back. From there, then we're ready to start a new round dealing out new resurface cards. So at this point, I wanna take you through one more round to show you a full round in example. So again, we'll go ahead and start with the resurface options. So we'll flip over our cards and we have two in the same zone and that is okay. From there, then we'll move on to the shark is going to choose. Then we go to the crew prepare. So the crew is going to be able to move around and, and do different things. So our crew members will both spend all of their actions to get back onto the boat. And Quint is also gonna come over and help them out. Hopefully we'll have that right space. Then the crew members are gonna choose their weapons. And for our characters, we'll all target this space here. Then the shark is going to reveal. So he has chosen B and we'll reveal his card, which is hard target. So the shark's evade value is three instead of whatever is shown on the card. All right, then we'll go into the fifth step. So the crew is going to attack. So the flare will be attached to the shark and it says, while attached at the end of each round, the shark must roll one die and take that many wounds. So we'll resolve that at the end of the round. Then we have the baseball bats of Brody's and the rifle of Hooper's. So we'll go ahead and do the baseball bat next. We'll roll two dice. We rolled two hits, which the shark's evade route value is three now. So since we didn't do any wounds, then it was a miss. So with the baseball bat, it lets us re-roll both dice if we miss. So let's go ahead and try again and see if we can do better. And no, so no luck there. And then the rifle. Now Hooper, with the evade rating of three, can choose not to shoot the rifle he wants to if he wants to save the rifle or if he has ammo. So he's going to go ahead and do that. He will not shoot as it is going to be pretty hard to do much damage to the shark at this point. So then we'll go into the shark's turn. So it's going to attack. And again, it'll target that boat space. So three dice. 
And it does four damage, so it's gonna destroy that boat space. So we'll go ahead and remove it. And our crew members are gonna go into the water. And I forgot to put out the shark marker, but that should be there too. Then finally, the shark will dive back into the depths and he gets a bonus attack on each crew member. So we'll start with Hooper. He takes two more, so that puts him down to, or he only has two hit points left. Over to Quint, takes one, and Brody is gonna take one. So our crew members are getting hit pretty good here. Then finally, we're gonna go ahead and resolve the flare as the shark goes back down. So the shark will roll a die, and he takes two damage as well. And then we'll go ahead and discard this. Our crew members will get their tokens back. Any cards that they used that get discarded will be discarded at this point. The flare will stay attached to the shark until he's able to shake it off with a resurface card. And we're ready to start a new round. This is gonna continue round after round until one of the three different endgame conditions is met, which are if all the crew members have been eliminated, the shark is going to win, or if all of the eight different zones of the orca have been destroyed, then the shark is also going to win, and if the shark's wound tracker reaches the X mark, then the shark is eliminated and the crew is going to win. Well, I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. If you found this video helpful, if you like what I do, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel as it really does make a big difference. It helps me to continue to grow and produce these videos. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. I do appreciate it and I try to take into account everything you guys say to make the best possible videos. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.